very good evening um, and a warm welcome to this event from the Festival of the Future City, which is part of the Bristol Festival Ideas. Um, I'm Jenny Lacey and for the next hour we're going to look at how the fabric of a city uh, and a corrupt planning process can contribute to social unrest and rebellion. How important it is for people to find somewhere to call home and how communities themselves need to be involved in designing their neighbourhoods. Marwa al Sabuni is an architect who has lived and studied in Homs, Syria's third city, throughout the devastation of the last few years of civil war. Uh, and Molly Crabapple is an artist and writer who uses her work to, to document injustice and suffering and who spent time in refugee camps around the world and has also been often to Syria. No, I've only, I've only been once, very once briefly to Syria, to Syria. Okay. Um, I, but I've done a lot of work with uh, Syrian refugees. Okay. And, and they both, Molly speaks perfect Arabic, so we were thinking of simply switching. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to have, a, we're going to have a, a talk and a discussion and uh, leave time for you to ask questions at the end because I suspect you may well have some questions. Um, and can I just say that, um, that we'll be signing books at the end. Molly has a wonderful book with wonderful illustrations, and this is um, a, an extraordinary book, isn't it? This is a, a brilliant and uh, heartbreaking book, and uh, I mean, I, I love this. I bought it when it came out. You all should buy it, like really buy two copies. Honestly, I recommend it. Okay, so it's called The Battle for Home, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So a very warm welcome to both of you. Um, I wondered if you might both like to start by defining home, and you're honest enough to admit in this that you find it very hard, yeah. but you do say that architects, if they don't know what home is, they can't start designing wider communities or do anything else. So home, what is home? I mean, I was, I was introduced to home, strangely enough, by war. So I think I compare it like when sickness introduced it to, to, the, to health, I think uh, the destruction of home taught me about to clean home. So I think, uh, do you want it in one word? <laughs> no, no, certainly not. You can have as many as you like. Okay, I think home is a place, first, first and foremost, uh, the place that succeeds in making you belong. And to make you belong, it should provide you exit, in a meaning that you don't feel stuck in a place or this applies for job and residence and relationships, so acceptance and familiar familiarity comes to mind as well. And I think this builds up while we are child and children. So, uh, and it should be beautiful also to make me relate to it. And uh, I think finally, as I speak in the book, it should be an accomplishment that makes me want to belong to it, like something to be proud of and something to be uh, part of, yes. Well, you travel all over the world. I don't know how much time you ever spend in your home, but uh, you come from New York. Tell us, tell us what home means to you. I thought what Marla said was very astute about only finding what home means in the context of war. All too often, one's sense of home uh, can be as invisible to one as um, the water is to the fish, or as the air is to us, and you only understand what home means when you've lost it, or when it's been threatened. My family is several generations back in New York, where the usual sort of a uh, Brooklyn mix. My dad is from Puerto Rico. My mother is uh, ch children of uh, Jewish immigrants, and. I never really thought of New York as home until, until I started to go places that were very different to it. Until I started to realize that what um, home perhaps meant to me was being able to speak in, um, being able to speak without thinking and having the uh, speed that I walked, the uh, amount that I cursed, <laughs> the uh, way that my gestures were, having all those things just sort of fit into the rhythm and uh, dance of the city in a way that they never fit elsewhere. I think, I think what we need to do now, and I imagine everybody wants to know this, um, is to talk about Homs. Uh, and it's so difficult to watch, and Molly knows this too, but to watch devastation and war and to see a whole country seemingly destroying itself or being destroyed. Um, so how is it in Homs now? It's much quieter. <laughs> uh, we live uh, in the, rem the remnants of the city, so, I can fairly say that we, 
I navigate through three neighborhoods now, and which is the city for me now. And uh, every uh, every uh, group has, or what remained of this group, had confined itself into its corner, or its, the remaining neighborhood they had, and uh, work and everything that used to happen around all over the city has shrunk into small stalls for grocery on pavement, uh, schools in building blocks, uh, residential blocks, uh, um, clinics instead of hospitals, um, very uh, traffic, traffic jams and uh, cement barriers that uh, cut off streets. And uh, we used to, now we have electricity for a month, straight month without any cuts, which is something to be celebrated back home. We used to have uh, very frequent cuts and very long cuts, and so the generators used to puff and puff all the day, and now it's much quieter. Uh, no battling, luckily, no battling in, in the streets, no, battle, no, no uh, sites of conflict, except for security checks. And so it's, it is in many ways better from the immediate uh, threats that we were struggling with for five, it's seven years, but the, the, the intense uh, battling could uh, enhance, I think, four years or five years. So it's much uh, relaxed now and uh, confined. Molly has, has, has spent a lot of time, I can't stop her drawing. <laughs> um, in migrants camps, and you and you have a lot of very interesting things to say about people who who go, who, who flee, and never really feeling at home. The phrase again. Um, but so why did you decide to stay? Why not? Okay, <laughs> but you have two children. You you weren't worried about their safety, or I don't think we can achieve death, and uh, I don't think that we can escape our faith. Uh, uh, so. We decided that it's more safe, logically, by the way, if you rash, rationalize the, the moment, if you did, didn't do the impulse of just running away, it's much safer, in a way, to stay in as long as not having the roof over your head uh, collapsing than to go on a journey in, in, in the ocean. So I wouldn't take my children, if, if you are talking about children, I wouldn't take my children to live in a tent. I wouldn't take my children to be uprooted from a place and be second or sometimes fifth grade uh, citizens. So I, I would rather to have them as long as, I, as, as I'm not forced, which was a big fortune for me that I wasn't forced to leave. Some people were just, they had their building falling off their heads. I didn't have that. We lived at the battle line. We had uh, tanks running down our window, we had uh, straying bullets inside our house, we had mortars at our door, but we didn't have to, to face that moment where some people had a gun in their head or a collapsing roof over their head to flee. So I guess uh, that's why I stayed. <laughs> Let me bring you in now because, it, because you've had the experience of, um, of being in and talking to people. Um, in migrant camps who, who had either fled or had been forced out. Do you think that what, what Mara was saying about, about how you, you don't ever feel right? I mean, I think it depends on, um, it depends on people's experiences. What, what, what you say about um, the, the, re the real horrors of people that are living, living in tents and dealing with this intense racism from these societies and this intense discrimination uh, rings uh, so true to um, to what I've to what I've heard from uh, the many people I've spoken to, um, not just the Syrians but Pakistanis, Afghans, uh, in camps uh, in Greece, Lebanon, Iraq. The thing is, everyone has to leave for different reasons. Uh, when, when I was in um, the uh, uh, Domiz camp in uh, northern Iraq in the Kurdish Autonomous Zone, many people um, were displaced multiple times. They tried very very hard to stay inside Syria. They might have left Aleppo because uh, they were uh, targeted for uh, arrest by the government. 
So they would go to their, their village in the northern Kurdish areas, which were then um, you know, attacked by ISIS. And then they would flee to uh, the Kurdish parts of Iraq, where the uh, just crushing uh, lack of any sort of future was the uh, primary thing that led them to say, my God, I've been living with my kids in a tent for years. My kids aren't getting an education. I'm uh, being incredibly exploited doing day labor, I'm not even getting paid for it sometimes. My savings are running out, so uh, why don't I uh, get in, uh, take my savings and pay some smugglers and make a desperate bid to try to at least get a future for my kids. And some of those people are in you know, camps now in Greece in uh, conditions that are even worse than the ones that I saw in Iraq. The world has treated uh, refugees with impossible cruelty. And I don't just uh, mean the, um, the states that we like to point a finger at, I also mean the EU as well, and I mean America as well. And I think that it's an utterly rational decision for someone to uh, want to stay in their home as opposed to uh, subjecting themselves to that. It's just, yeah, it's a decision that everyone weighs for themselves. We're really talking about architecture, uh, uh, and, and Molly's got some wonderful questions I know about Islamic architecture, but before we do that, um, it's interesting, it says, it says on the, on the back of this book that it's an angry and personal memoir. Uh, and, and one of the fascinating things is your your description of how the government, how, how how they behaved in terms of architecture actually led to the conflict. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's such an unusual view, isn't it, that architecture can play a part in, in this kind of war. First, I, I, I don't think it's angry, because I don't think you can rationalize uh, things while you are angry. So, I think it's critical uh, in the way that I think uh, the way that we build our surroundings dedicate and perpetuate certain patterns, certain living patterns. And in this way, uh, we perpetuated in our cities segregation and we perpetuated inequality and we replaced uh, so many successful models that we had in our cities with the failing, uh, important sometimes models. Uh, and that's affected our cities in economic way, in social way, in psychological way. And uh, I think uh, basically we excluded people from their place and cut the relationship between people and their place and between people among themselves, with, which intensed uh, Tensions and made it right for explosion. Talk about um, also about, uh, and, and I think this is where we could bring Molly in about um, lack of respect for old buildings and also the way that in the past, before you know, the worst of the corruption, in the past people respected each other's religious buildings. We still respect uh, each other's religious buildings. I hope uh, some there there have been uh, barbaric. Uh, attacks among people, especially in the countryside. <coughs> but we still respect churches and mosques, which, which I hope that will continue. Uh, I think the way that our, uh, our spiritual places were built is, was, uh, was very uh, encouraging for people to live with each other. Because uh, churches were built back to back with mosques, and uh, people had literally back to back. Literally back to back and door to door, and so just you know, few meters, and uh, people were passing by, going out from their prayers, greeting each other, working with each other, living with each other. We still have this, by the way, although very vandalized, but we still have this, and um, they were interwoven in the life of, of the, the people and in the city. They weren't symbols of, uh, of uh, or labels like a flag. This is my territory. No, it was something to go and a reminder, a reminder of the, the moral uh, system that people could um, relate to each other within or under its umbrella. umbrella. So uh, this has its traces in the old cities, not in the new development uh, neighborhoods, um, but it, it is still there. One of the things that uh, I thought was most beautiful in your book was you talked about the notion of scale and how 
a lot of uh, modern cities, particularly in the Middle East, are built on this uh, scale that's not human, that's bigger than human, that almost like dwarfs the human. Something that maybe looks really good in you know, brochures or from an airplane, but isn't made to interact with on street level. And you, um, you counterpose this to the scale of uh, the traditional city in the Middle East. Can you tell me more about your thoughts on scale and how that affects people's lived experience in the city? I think it's not only the scale of the building, it's also the scale of the layers that made up the building. So uh, the scale of details, the scale of the street, the, the, even, I mean, more important than scale, I think the sense of incorporation, which used the older <coughs> elements inside their own structures. So I guess with the destruction, as I said, the destruction has been uh, a learning lesson. Some older uh, elements have been exposed by the battling, by the shelling. So you go into one mosque uh, in old homes and you see uh, pillars from Hellenistic times. So thousands of years back, just coming up, out of the of the the walls of the of the of the mosque, and you have also in the souk we had uh, it was a temple of the sun location, so even when they built uh, in in Ottoman style they built arches and built uh, to do to do vaults and do the shops, they used for the key the keystone they used. Uh, Stones from the Temple of the Sun, so it has the the, the face of the of the sun god or something. So they used everything, they incorporated uh, things, and that uh, also was picked up by people. So people used that in their relationships. They used what what is available. They they negotiated their relationship with each other. They they were meant. They were meant in this harmonious sense and. This sense of uh, scale that we are talking about, scale in here, um, relates to the building material, which we abandon in, in our new architecture. Well, uh, there's a, um, a phrase you used, which I thought was just a, a really beautiful. I, I, I have to admit that when I found out that you wrote this in English, I think it's an extraordinary accomplishment. Because it's, why well, do you say that? But it's, a, it's very beautifully written, isn't it? it it's, it's very well poetically written. Um, and so I was going to ask you to read this in Arabic because I kind of presumed that you <laughs> and given that I uh, understand Arabic as well. But it's a it's a wonderful phrase. So in, the, in the, you read it in English first because you wrote it. Okay, but my English reading is horrible. By the way. No, 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 no. Okay. So when when the built environment creates an experience of generosity and tenderness, feeling offering uh, freely. I need more glasses. <laughs> <laughs> freely offering fragrances. Nurturement, cool breezes, and shade in summer, and shelter from the rain and wind in winter. It becomes like a mother that cares for her children. You become a brother or sister to your neighborhoods. Neighbors. Okay. Do you Arabic? To, yes, please. Because I just imagine it's very the whole idea of the, the Google the Translate now. <laughs> <laughs> تقدم بالمجان روائح عطرة ورعاية ونسيما نسيما باردا وظلا في الصيف وحماية من من المطر والريح في الشتاء تصبح مثل أم ذات تحن على أولادها وتصبح وتصبح أنت أخا أو أختا لجيرانك. <تصفيق> So that's the ideal, isn't it? That, that that's how a, a home should, well, not just a home, but a neighbourhood should caress you and, and look after you. And I know that both of you, and, and I think you should talk to each other about this, both of you are great fans, as I hope many of us are here, of Jane Jacobs, and the idea of a community um, coming together to make sure that they are involved in how a, a neighbourhood is and how the buildings are, and not allowing somebody to just come in and bulldoze the whole thing. Do you want to come on? You're a New Yorker. You start us off on Jane Jacobs. Oh God! Well, I, I'm sure everyone here um, knows about uh, Saint Jane, and we don't need to <laughs> we don't need to introduce her. But one of the problems that uh, faces New York always is that New York is a city with no respect for the old. 
New York is a city that uh, gleefully bulldozes its architectural treasures, like uh, the old Penn Station, and replaces them with uh, hideous monstrosities uh, for profit. It's a city that um, whose formative value is money uh, rather than beauty or community. And uh, the uh, way that it throws out the old is uh, reflected by that. But Jane Jacobs had a different vision. Jane Jacobs had a vision of a city that was not merely luxury housing towers and not merely uh, pre-planned housing projects either, but a city of um, organic communities uh, that people lived in, that they spent their lives in. A city that wasn't organized from top down, but that was rather arranged by uh, people's actual habits of living. And, you know, one of the things that um, I, I think is interesting, is, and it's mentioned in every single one of Marwa's review, uh, reviews of Marwa, is that the sort of top-down um, architectural uh, ideal was something that was forced upon the Middle East a lot. Uh, the classic example is uh, Le Corbusier, who um, wanted to take all of old Algiers and replace it with uh, freestanding apartment towers because that would look very nice from a plane, wouldn't it? You know, and that would really satisfy your, you know, the ego of an architect. But that's something that has nothing to do with how anyone lives, and it's something that's impossible to have a community in. And I thought that Marwa, I mean, when I read this book, I was like, man, this woman writes like a Syrian Jane Jacobs. And I, I thought that you, you paid such beautiful tribute to uh, the texture of lived community. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for visiting. But I, uh, I was introduced actually to Jane Jacobs after the release of my book. So a friend of mine from America said you would, you would be very inspired by Jane Jacobs. He was absolutely right. And uh, I read The Death uh, and Life of American Cities. And what I found very inspiring is that not only this, uh, this social aspect that Jane Jacobs uh, talk about rather the economic role of architecture that she has so much insight on. Like uh, one of the ideas I was very impressed and I found it applicable and enhanced is the self-destructive uh, quality the, of success. So when she speaks about excessive copying, basically she speaks about when uh, she, she mentions that uh, diversity is one of the key elements of making a city successful, which is absolutely right. But she speaks about the peak that the city will reach in its success, that people will start copying success. So diversity that, uh, that uh, was enabled by economic support and social support that the built environment created, uh, she, she speaks about the people will uh, uh, trace which, which was the most successful pattern and they will copy this and this will uh, eliminate the, others, the other elements that caused that, su that success. So after the peak, the, the collapse happened. And in Homs, we have this in textile. We had in, in, uh, in the 1911, we had a boom in population. We reached 50,000 people, <laughs> not even 50,000 uh, people population. And uh, we had 10,000 looms. So imagine one loom for each family. So this competitiveness, this copying, caused the collapse of textile industry altogether. When they, they called upon labor and they couldn't find labor, so the textile collapsed. So this is one of the the eye-opening uh, insights of Jane Jacobs that I, I admire so much. You, you talk about a kind of, um, one of the things you talk about is a, a, is a sort of model community um, in some ways, and it's where your husband comes from, and you can pronounce it because I've struggled. Okay. <laughs> it's okay, Baba. Which is, a, which is a sort of, how do we describe it? It's kind of satellite town just outside Holmes, and it's really where the, re where the rebellion and, and the fight against the government started, or certainly was most intense. The violence erupted there. First ignites of uh, violence erupted there. Uh, I think it's a, it's one area of the informalities areas that uh, surround cities. So basically, forty percent of the Syrian population lived in such areas, 
and those areas were created outside uh, outside of the plan of the city. So, but you don't notice it. It's it's basically uh, slums, but in, not in the the look of shanty housing. Rather, the e just bare blocks of cement uh, or just an informal building. The main quality in, in those areas are uh, is the floating property status. So some people would have uh, would have full uh, ownership of their property. Some people will have shared. Some people don't have any ownership of their property. The problem with these areas is the same problem that you have with your own slums. It's it's uh, excluding, like cages for people, it's ghettos for people to live around the city, to create parallel life to the city, and not being contributing into the city. So in this case, in, in Babam, it was very, I dedicated a complete chapter here because, because it wasn't slum in the meaning that people were there uh, just uh, for uh, in the socialist employment system, where most of the the slums are in this case. Babar had agricultural land, so people were farming and had craft, and had a very educated uh, percentage of people. So they had doctors, engineers, etc. But people of the city just next door couldn't accept those people because of the difference in their lifestyles and in their buildings. Um, but I think, uh, sorry, <laughs> I lost track I don't of know, I was thinking, about, well, because you describe it, when we, when we talked about the, the Jane Jacobs vision, you describe this place as being almost like that, where it was safe for the children to be on the streets because people, there were communities where people knew each other, there were people who worked, small craftsmen who, who worked, you know, the industry was amongst the streets as well. So it sounded, in one sense, like a, a wonderful place to live. It was corrupted by property. Uh, when they, uh, we had a very bad mayor r right after uh, the uprise. So this mayor uh, adjusted the investment uh, percent percentage so people could uh, could build up towers now. And uh, when that happened in Babam, people started just selling off their property and trading in in in, uh, in their property and. Suddenly, you have this corruption in their built environment. You don't, you don't know. People just started just competing and and damaging prices and, and that sort of thing. But by the way, the Syrian cities all over the cities and towns and villages were extremely safe before the war. So uh, you could, as a woman, I could go. I don't go in three in the morning, but you you could you could. You could go, and I know friends that would come from a wedding, wedding driving alone, uh, just <coughs> two in the morning or twelve at night, and it's completely safe. You could just go. As a child, I used to just go on my bike alone, and uh, even I used to run through the green belt alone. So it, it was very, very safe. So that's why it was very surprising for so many people that we had this amount of violence, this amount of uh, unsafety. We need to talk about, um, because obviously this is partly what the book is about, about as well, is how architecture can heal wounds. Uh, do you want to, shall we start with you, do you want to <laughs> talk about how, how you think that might be possible from your experiences? I mean, I, I don't know if, I don't know if I have solutions to that. I suppose um, I might start with a question. So. Homs was the site of some of the worst massacres by the Syrian government, um, and also um, the site of horrible crimes uh, by the rebels that were fighting the government. Um, the place uh, you know, Marie Colvin was killed by the Syrian government. And I always wonder, and this is my, my question, I have no answer, how a city addresses the horrors of the past, um, whether it's better to build in a way that doesn't acknowledge them, so that people can have a, a new life free from that trauma, whether it's uh, better to um, pay it some tribute in the built environment like uh, Berlin does. I don't know, I don't have answers for that. I certainly don't think, um, I think that architecture shapes so many things. I don't know if it, I'd like to think it be, could be used for the cause of justice too. I don't know, but what, what, do, you, what do you think? I think that it's a better, it's a better um, question for you than for me about 
Surely it's not the only remedy, it's not yeah. the magic wand. But uh, I, for me, it, I think it's the beginning of the solution because many people are leaving because they find there's no exit. And I think our built environment could offer this exit because it could offer you means of life, place to live, place to work. So <coughs> aside of this, it could also connect you to the other. So I think that we have, we have in our old cities a very successful model, which used to work very well before it was vandalized and wiped off. So why not draw lessons from those urban settlements that dedicated place for trade, for work, uh, good size uh, of property, good sense of scale, um, sustainable material, uh, neighbors, and uh, why, why not create this for the people? I remember someone who is just so primitive with people. They will tell you about it if you just ask them. I, I, I spoke to a carpenter uh, like two months ago, and he, we were talking about people who come from the slums or come from those informalities and settled now in the new residential areas. So have this demographical washing machine and all of that. Everybody is like musical chairs. The, people, the rich moved out and the poor came in. So everybody is in everybody's shoes now. So I asked him, do you think those people are going back to their places? And he said, absolutely not. They think, they, they, what we were missing. Look at those places. So they will, they will demand this kind of respectful place for them. And uh, this is good. But he said something that uh, that I, I told him, uh, why don't you go back to your place? And he said that we have now new neighbors. And I, what do you mean? And he said those neighbors are not in our. They don't have the same thinking that we have. So he said one sentence that the, far, the further you go off the center, the more stiff the head become. So I, it's so primitive, but it's so, it's, for me it was so uh, eye-opening because he meant that people couldn't negotiate. And negotiation comes from this relationship that could be created by architecture, where to place people what kind of surroundings you can you, you make them look at. And uh, I, I think you will have softer, <laughs> softer heads now by that. T tell us about what's going to happen though, because um, are we Let saying- Let me look at the well, exactly. crystal ball first. <laughs> here, here we are, you're saying it's quiet now. Yeah. Um, and a lot of Syria is certainly quieter. But is somebody talking about rebuilding? They can't possibly, I mean, obviously, Thousands of people must have gone. There must be no way of knowing. Millions of people. Millions. But so we half. have ha half the population of Syrian population is either refugees, asylum seekers, or internally displaced people. So out of the 23 millions, half of them is in the musical chairs you were talking about. Yeah. So in your city, for example, um, there must somebody must be talking, presumably, about rebuilding. Somebody must be talking about signing contracts. <laughs> signing contracts. Who's going to pay? Who's going to be in control? Are you going to, after all this appalling devastation, is it just going to be exactly the same corrupt system as it was before? Probably, yes, probably not. I don't know. I mean, it, who, who would predict that we will have this war on our, on your TV screens and our lives for seven, seven years? I mean, could be, it could go in a very wrong way, and it could be adjusted. It depends on who will listen, <coughs> who have the will, who, I mean, I don't think that anybody would uh, like to see Syria in this way, or any place, uh, frankly. It's so heartbreaking, even enemies would sympathize with you. So I don't think that even 
Syrian officials or senior Syrian people or private sector or businessmen would like to see their country devastated and destroyed in this way. So, but it, it's a matter of awareness and a matter of will. And it doesn't take too many people. We will always have corruption as everybody has. But it, it depends on scale. Yeah, what kind, of, what kind of percentage? Do you feel from the people that you've met, do you feel people will go home, want to go home? <coughs> I mean, it depends uh, where, where people are, what sort of lives they've been able to build. Uh, I mean, one of my uh, friends who is from Homs, he's going to med school in Berlin right now. And he's, you know, a young gay guy who has a boyfriend there and has a great job at a cafe and is quite happy. Um, I know other friends that are in Turkey and um, dealing with an incredible amount of racism and would very much like to go home uh, as long as they were assured that you know, they would be safe when they did. Um, I think it all depends on whether or not people uh, feel that they, uh, that they can go home, that they'll be, they'll be safe if they go home. Um, I mean, one of the things that I do, I do know about homes is that, as Marwa was saying, a lot of these um, you know, properties were um, unofficially built. And um, when people who were displaced by the war are returning to certain districts, uh, the government is asking for um, you know, both proof of ownership and also um, for these people to have a, a clean record from security services. And that's obviously something that you know, during the Civil War and uh, in a country where so many people lived in um, unpermitted buildings, both meeting both of these requirements is difficult. So people like that probably won't be able to return to their neighborhoods uh, because of policy. But almost everyone I know, if given the choice, um, would like to go home, almost everyone. I can comment on this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I used to teach in university. So I asked uh, students, <coughs> they are all preparing their stuff to go and emigrate after having their degree. So I asked them, uh, would you come back? And they have, all, all of them have the same answer. If it's all right and very good and built well, and we, sure, we will come. Okay, <laughs> said you will never come back. Then <laughs> who will build it? Who will fix it? If you all going to, to wait until it's built and it's all uh, jobs for everyone and the economy is very good, you will never come back. And I think that we have to blame ourselves, uh, being sort of greedy in a sense or lazy in a sense, that we want it to be ready for us to come back. Tell us a little bit about, because you want to, this is a kind of dream, and you, you said to me through this Festival of Future City that they're not going to allow you to participate in the rebuilding of your country. No, I, I didn't you say think, that. I didn't do you think it's true? Didn't allow me to, why not? No, I, I don't think that. But you did a competition which, with a wonderful scheme which won a United Nations. Yeah, they just it. gave me the deaf ear. <laughs> <laughs> so just talk to us about that and about your vision for how things, you thought it would be. Uh, I have to comment at first okay. that, that I don't believe in one man or one woman vision. So it's a competition uh, way of demonstrating perhaps how to do things, not, uh, not ideally this is the vision, go and implement yeah, this. Not imposing yeah. it, but a, a kind of idea that people could be part of. And how to draw lessons, because I think that our role is to ask the right questions now. What do we need? What had worked? Uh, why did this fail? Um, those questions are very ignored. The, the replacement or the alternative question is how to make profit, uh, how to make a good business of this, how to make it quick. Now you hear news about building uh, a building a residential block 15 stories in 16 days. This is actually happening using a new techniques by, by the sliding mold. This is actually happening right now. So we are just asking the wrong questions and doing the wrong thing to just, where to box people? People won't be going to live in this box. They will build informal housing, and you will go and demolish that housing and destroy their businesses, and they will be angry, and you will have the same cycle again. So 
I don't want them to, <laughs> to let me go and work, just to ask the right questions or just listen to, to what is important and what's on the line, really. But you describe in the book an incredible struggle to even qualify as an architect. The, the, to, that, to have, and by this is a, 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 a wonderful description, not wonderful description of you running across the city, just trying to get your thesis done, and your PhD done, and how many obstacles were put in your way. So how easy is it going to be for people with, uh, with the kind of ideas that you have about themselves and other people, how easy is it going to be for you to be part of the rebuilding? I mean, it's not only for me or for architects, it's just, you know, it's, you can say that people who are perhaps chosen to be straight, it's very difficult for them. They will be either called uh, difficult, a very difficult person, <laughs> and, uh, or just, you know, or naive sometimes, or just dreamy. So we have to change, we, we have this uh, social disease now that lying, we have so many people lying. And uh, I think uh, that's why we have, uh, we have uh, this respect of people who, who insist to do things right. So uh, I think part of the, part of the, the struggle to get my PhD, believe it or not, the professors so-called professors that they were opposing this this because it was about Islamic architecture. So it was so religious. <laughs> Although it's about stereotyping Islamic architecture, I'm talking about how the copy-paste approach, but it's just narrow-minded and uh, yeah, I think we are putting, uh, this is well acknowledged by everyone that we have the wrong people in the wrong places to, to just put the right people in the right place. And I promised that you could ask about Islamic architecture. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think that Marwa has done a, probably a good idea about uh, covering what, what I would have asked, but what do you think were the elements of, um, and I, I know you did such a great uh, job of picking apart how people use like the words traditional and Islamic in a lazy way, so forgive me for doing, repeating that myself, but um, what was it about the traditional architecture? What was that element that, um, assured people's coexistence and that element that is not uh, being taken advantage of when people try to do like Islamic architecture now? The sense of in incorporation I talked about. Islamic architecture wasn't about canceling any existing layer that have, that have been existing. So they picked up each layer, layer and incorporated it in the same way, I mean they had the knowledge and the craftsmanship and all the elements that would make a good uh, architectural style, I think this applies to many older uh, architectural styles, whether, whether was it maybe Roman, Gothic, whatever. I mean, we have this all over the world where uh, this sense of uh, targeting different functions and interweaving this into a good solution, but in a very beautiful way. Uh, this is not special about Islamic architecture, but I think that what was special is the sense of layering. They do layering in a very good way, in a very harmonious way. And uh, for me, the incorporation they did, the, the use of every piece of stone, piece of uh, thought, was, uh, was a very brilliant way to, to do visiting. I actually, I, I thought about Marwa's book uh, recently because I was reporting from Puerto Rico uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Now, uh, Puerto Rico was completely uh, devastated by this hurricane in ways that I'm sure you know. And I spent a, quite a bit of time at my friend's uh, village, which is a mountain that doesn't have um, water or electricity or anything else. And one of the first things you notice when you're there is that the old Spanish style houses are built for this, right? You can be inside those houses and there's something about the way that the windows and the balconies and the skylights and everything is that makes air circulate. And they're actually uh, livable. But that um, the American suburban style houses um, are not, they're basically furnaces. You cannot be in them uh, without electricity. And, you know, Puerto Rico is a colony and America sort of um, bolted on um, 
American style houses, American style uh, ways of agriculture, ways of not doing agriculture, bolted on Walmarts and McDonald's and all of that. And one of the first things that you notice when you visit there after disaster is that what America bolted on doesn't work. It doesn't work when there's a disaster. And in fact, it immediately turns into horror. It turns into homes you can't be in, um, massive, um, horrifying lines to get to get water outside of Costco that lasts 16 hours. It turns into um, it turns into something very, very dystopian because it was made without any sort of regard for um, people's land or climate or culture or how they lived. And I think that um, one of the real like um, lessons of her book, of Marwa's book, that's so important is about how these bolted on systems, you know, distort and lead to terrible, terrible things. I'm going to um, see if anybody wants to, uh, because we've, we're running out of time, well, not running out of time, but we, um, we have about 15 minutes left. So I wondered if anybody wanted to ask any questions of, uh, of Mara or of Molly. Anybody at all who wants to ask? Yes. We have a microphone somewhere, do we? Lovely. It's right down at the front. So if you could put your hand up again, and then we'll find you. Thank you. Um, it's asking you to perhaps explain your meaning of the word exit. Um, I see exit as a sort of escape, but it sounds as though your meaning of exit is much different to that. Could you say a bit more, or maybe it is about that? No, I, I think uh, one of the things that I liked about Bristol today, I was talking to Zoe, that uh, having uh, these links uh, in, in the streets, you basically don't get stuck in any way. So you have all these stairs to, to, to link with the different uh, topography levels, and you have those small alleyways that you could and get back into to your main road. You don't you don't get stuck. You don't get lost. You could expand this conception into into the way that even with work, let's say uh, in my country, we didn't have this uh, regulations that could uh, lead you into poverty in any, or bankru bankruptcy. So whatever. So you could open a shop or you could have a, a, a small stall, or you could just uh, make a circle of uh, education or something, or, a, uh, or open a small institute. So people would just, you know, uh, or work as an employee in the morning, as a taxi driver in the evening. So e people would be very resourceful into finding an exit, really, to, to have jobs, to do things, to, uh, to save themselves. And I think this applies, I, I gave you, I think, the two, two edges of the thing, that walk, from walking to this, in the street and finding your way, or finding a small shop to buy a bottle of water, or to the big decisions that could uh, affect your life, like uh, saving yourself from bankruptcy, <coughs> or, or uh, finding yourself as homeless thing. So I think when you have this lap, the one I was reading about, the mother lap to, to fall on. Uh, I think this is exit. My, my city was called, uh, in a nickname, the mother of the poor. So, because uh, everything was cheap, uh, people could just um, find their exit. So if you are with small, small things to do, you could uh, work and live and marry and have children and fall on the lap of the city. So you weren't trapped, in other words. You weren't trapped in hopelessness. Yes. There was always some way of going down Christmas steps or finding your way out yes. or finding some little way of earning a living. Or yes. there, was, there was never a feeling that you were kind of, that you were caged in, that, that life was impossible. Not never, but yeah, yeah, much less than you would expect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got one about four rows back. Um, I was, this is a slightly factual question, I guess, but um, is, I'm imagining there is now basically a massive housing crisis in Syria, given that 
so many people have left their cities and so much of the urban environment has just been completely destroyed. Um, the factual question is, what is the attitude at the moment of the government around the rebuilding and like the rehousing of all those people? Do you this think that they'll try and do it in a quite organised way or will they let it be in form? And your, my question, like your opinion on that is, what do you think the best the best approach to rehousing of those people would be? Thank you. Uh, I think one of the main uh, problems we had in Syria is housing. So they were struggling with finding a housing, uh, they call it housing strategy, and they had a housing ministry, and they were trying to do, uh, they introduced the housing for the poor and housing for the youth, and, and always were, were faced by delays, by, uh, by empty projects, by vacant housing units, uh, by demand that was not met, and we had this, we called it the housing crisis. And it, it continued. We had a housing crisis before the war, and we still have a housing crisis now after the war. Um, I don't think, we don't have the transparency that I would know as a citizen what the government is thinking of, or planning to, but I think their main issue is economic issue. So we have a currency that is is uh, now it's uh, it's less than its original value by uh, ten times. So the economy is brought into its knees. People are in the. I think the government now is um, again. I'm just you know. I'm in, I'm not a. Uh, I'm not a. I'm not an institutional figure. But just from a citizen point of view, I think there are. Their main concern is economic revi uh, economy revival. So it could be good in a way, but I think they are following the traditional or the expected way of, uh, of uh, reviving this economic activity by investing into housing, which will never work. They will invest in housing, they will be, they will be repeating the same cycle because investing in housing meaning that for them, providing new boxes, as I said, uh, 15 stories in 16 days, and just, so I don't think it's 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 uh, a thoughtful way or being uh, a vision or a visionary way to, to look at housing. Well, why why is that not the right? Why I'm not saying it's the right approach, but why do you think that's the wrong approach, especially <laughs> given that that I imagine there's a need to like very quickly rehouse a huge number of people as well? Because we lack the knowledge to do it quickly and right. We need to have, I mean, things need time. And we waste time on investment and making de deals and making profit and just rushing to implementation. Thank you very much. Does anybody else like to ask anything? So do you, uh, let's, let's ask both of you, coming from your perspective, you, um, Marwa, you start. Do you do you have a kind of feeling of hope from your perspective of travelling the world and not not I'm not going to ask you about America, but <laughs> from oh, the other oh, places you've oh, been. Uh, oh God! I, well, I, I think I uh, ended our, our lecture yesterday on a grim note. I do you do you want me to give my like grim speech about like, yeah, yeah, climate change and fascism? <laughs> okay. Um, so basically, th this is my this is my um, grim speech. <laughs> Very grim. So, climate change is going to create an amount of people that can no longer live where they are, uh, that will dwarf the amount of people that um, migrated in 2015. And these people are going to have to move and they're going to have to settle elsewhere, and often they're going to have to settle in countries to which they do not have passports. And the fundamental challenge of our age, beyond stopping climate change, is dealing with borders because if we do not think of a way where people are allowed to move and live in countries that they don't have passports, then when significant portions of, say, Bangladesh are underwater, what are the countries around it going to do? We need to think of a system that's beyond borders because um, when there is mass movement created um, by uh, climate change, if we're still 
cleaving to this current system of borders and of walls and of restrictions, it's going to lead to fascism. It's going to lead to fascism that is bloody and that is horrific and that is inhuman. So that is my uh, grim meat hook future prediction. But um, in terms of do I have hope, I, I mean, people, people are extraordinary and resilient. I've met so many brilliant, brave people around the world and they will always give me hope. But uh, that's my, my systematic critique that I think we have to deal with. Uh, so go on, uh, do something about that. So we're going to stay in this comfortable, reasonably comfortable country of ours, and you're going to go off to London, and then you're going to go home. Do you have hope for Syria? I have to. I have to. Otherwise, I mean, we are continuing to live, and we cannot live in despair. And uh, I think, uh, I believe in God, <laughs> so I believe in uh, I mean, we are all in, uh, in safe hands, and we will end up in whatever is meant to be, as long as we, I mean, from me, I do what I have to do, and hope for the best. So. And you're committed, obviously, to staying there and bringing your children up there, and hoping that there are enough Syrians who behave properly, that it becomes a better country. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I'm, I'm, we, we, as parents, uh, hope that we planted a good seed in our children and we hope that they will grow up as uh, one brick in building their country as we as as individuals also hoping that we will be a brick in building our country and as an architect if somebody gave you a kind of dream commission which involves asking people what they wanted as well what would you like to do uh, you mean from my city? Yes. I wonder in my city, I just, you know, why don't we do this and why don't we do that? I think one of the major, major crimes related to the city is burying the river, which was done all over the Syrian cities. We buried every single river that used to run through our cities. Why? Stupidity. <laughs> Investment, they build up roads over it. So, uh, bringing up the river and bringing nature into the city again, reviving the souk and uh, building in the old basalt stone that we have, I, and reviving crafts. Yeah. Thank you both very much, Need. Can I just say that um, before we thank the Properly. Marwa and Molly will both be outside in the foyer um, signing books because another event is going to come in here, so we need to find the exit. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you're very welcome to talk to both of them about what they do and, um, and to look at some of Molly's wonderful well, pictures in her book as well. Sorry, did you want to ask something? Just a quick question. I think we need a microphone though, or we can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Hold on, because we can't hear you, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Marwal Salvini. Uh, I'm a Syrian architect. Uh, I wrote a book called The Battle for Home, which was published in London by Thames and Hudson in 2016. I'm a mother of two, and I live in Homs in Syria. And um, we listened to your talk, and it was very interesting. And one of my questions um, was, I was wondering, when you think about refugees, you imagine young people and families and, and, and kids. But what, what about the old people? Um, it's a very good question, yeah. Um, are they still in homes, for example? So it just comes to a very big city. I can imagine it has a big... The problem is, it's a very good question, thank you for asking, because those folks are, are the left, uh, the leftovers, you could say, it's just, you know, people are treating them as, uh, they think they are no longer needed, and they don't have any jobs left, and they don't have any families left, and um, large portions uh, or percentage of those people are just, you know, living on the margins of of life, which is very um, shameful 
because uh, they are they are not as old as you you may imagine. So people above 50, which is treated as no longer needed. Although we need all the experience and all the knowledge they have, but we just they live on the margins of life. So what can they do? They don't do anything. They're just living and waiting. They receive money from their family, from abroad, or they have uh, small things to, like uh, a land to 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 <laughs> a land to, to rent or some ev some venues for uh, some avenues from other businesses, and they are living on their savings. countries are not interested in uh, they are interested in labor and expertise and so they are not interested in those uh, age groups so basically no one needs them so they they know that and it's it's devastating and what's about the other side of the point you mentioned that you you teach still teach at the university i taught two years in private in the university but I had to stop and not renew my contract because of the situation that our educational system, the direction is taken is also business, is also making profit. Um, it's like selling the certificates to, to students and the students know this and they are just you know buying their way into the college by tuitions. And uh, I, I basically refuse to, to be part of uh, this game. Part of uh, look, uh, if you went to the university as a young man, you don't have to be conscripted in army. So it's it's uh, it's a way to to to, to postpone this uh, this uh, destiny in a way so they 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 just apply for college for either to to get diploma and emigrate or to postpone the military service or just to to fill their free time like uh, so many girls you know on the other hand it just you know they don't have anything to do and i know that from my students because i had like uh, i had 100 100 uh, student in my in my class and I know that only 10% of those students were in interested in knowledge while the others are just you know spending time thank you, very much. Thank, you. thank you thank you